so first of all, we uh, we love people who love Morrowind. You know, that was uh, another game I directed. So you know, we we I view each game as its own thing, and the vibe we were going for in Morrowind was stranger in a strange land. That uh, it felt alien. That feels wrong for Skyrim, right? Skyrim shouldn't feel like this isolated alien place the way we treated that section of Morrowind. Um, <clears throat> Oblivion in Cyrodiil, we did, coming off of Morrowind, want to go back to the more classic fantasy. So if you look at the Elder Scrolls, between Arena, Daggerfall, Oblivion, Morrowind is the odd one out. One of the things that is really great about Morrowind, and the reason you know, we love it as well, is that there's this, the wonder of discovery in Morrowind is, is heightened because of how it's delivered. So what we're trying to do with Skyrim is, is walk that line. So at first glance, it does come across as, you know, traditional fantasy. But then the culture of the world, um, we do have dwarven ruins are back in this game. Um, how the different uh, Nordic cultures view certain things, um, and it is different even in different parts of this world. Um, much like in Morrowind where, you know, House Redrand or Talvani would treat things differently, we have that differently between the various holds in Skyrim. So we're trying to walk that line where we have that wonder of discovery and that unique culture in Skyrim, uh, but also make it appropriate to what Skyrim should be in the Elder Scrolls, just like I think Morrowind was appropriate for what it was. I mean, the graphic style that you saw today is the graphic style of Skyrim, but you didn't see everything in Skyrim as far as um, the different landscapes, the different dungeons and things like that, so it does vary it up quite a bit. Are you going to get things that are alien as the Telvanni in Morrowind? No. No, it's a different, different style for that game. The last Elder Scrolls thing we did was Shivering Isles, and it's pretty it gets pretty alien, um, so um, I, I would I would never rule it out. We just kind of do what we're excited about for that time and what we think is appropriate visually for the game we're doing. And we do think no matter what happens in the future, we'll treat each game as its own entity. And we're perfectly comfortable with people arguing over it. You know, I have no doubt people will play this game no matter how much you put into it. They'll say. I liked Oblivion better, I like Daggerfall better, I like Morrowind better. Because um, they each kind of have their own tone. And things that they'll do well and things they won't do as well as, as another game for one reason or another. There's always more fidelity graphically that you can put in something. So if we had a new system that had more memory and pushed more polygons, the game would have a bit more detail on things. But honestly, with HD graphics now, we're able to make it look the way we'd, we'd want it to look. So things might, uh, you know, have more detail close up, but I think environment-wise, you know, 20 feet in front of you would probably look the same. Um, you know, more speed will allow you to, to always put more detail, put more people on the screen. We, won't, we wouldn't have to make as many choices between uh, how many polygons or memory do we put in the environment versus the people. So our bigger cities, still have walls that load you so that if if you know we were on a next gen system that might be something we wouldn't have to do memory wise you know to section that off but at the end of the day the experience is kind of the same you would just be walking smoothly into that city as opposed to clicking the door waiting for the load and then going in i don't know how um i don't really dwell on those things to be honest like what we we can't do this and we can't do this so i'm kind of thinking on my feet things that we could do you know for the most part the list that we made of technical features we wanted after Fallout 3, we got all those done and then kept going. We got more done technically than we had planned on. You know, most of the things you're going to get out of a new console are mostly graphical. So right now, uh, we're able to do whatever we can design and have time to code and balance and those kind of things, role-playing wise, stats, systems, AI, relationships, dynamism, all that stuff, we're able to get it all done. The hardware isn't holding us back in any way. Um, there are a lot more traps. You saw a few traps there. We've gone a long way with traps. Uh, we just, they're a lot of fun. Um, so there's a lot more of that and, and spatial puzzles uh, with things like that. When it comes to like the kind of more 
adventure gamery puzzles that you saw there. Um, I, d I don't know the exact number, to be honest. More than we've done before. That, that's the best way to say it. Uh, we're currently around 120, which is a lot. And then we have what we call POIs, points of interest. They're like, you know, little mini um, uh, encounters that we have outside. It might just be an altar with some necromancers around it, something like that. Um, and there's... There's well over a hundred of those at last count. Um, I don't have an exact number of that either. The numbers get so big that we stop counting <laughs> these kind of things, so... Um, uh, a lot, yeah. So the giants have their own camps. And for some of the creatures that are like natural creatures and they roam and do stuff, um, you know, they just are what they are, whether it's we have wolves and deer and elk and um, they have their little dens, but we don't, we don't have to spend a lot of time on how they live. When it comes to like giants, uh, the, the draugers that you saw, we have some other creature types we're not talking about yet. We've really not got into like just, okay, this is who they are, but then where do they live? How do they live? What's all the clutter that goes with that? Um, so when you see giants in the game, they're often with mammoths. We didn't show that today, but we will in the future. And their camps and their fires and how they dress themselves. Um, things like that we've really gotten into to make it believable as opposed to just, here's a creature and they walk around and they attack you. So that would be the, you know, the difference. And, and there are obviously some creatures that are more important than others that have gotten more attention. Um, and in the future we'll be showing more of the creatures and more of, uh, you know, how they, how they live and where they live. Uh, gods of the Elder Scrolls are still the gods of the Elder Scrolls. Whether they're the Aedra, the, you know, the eight, nine divines, or the Daedra, they're all, uh, not all, a lot of them make an appearance again. I think that's part of what's cool about the Elder Scrolls. Um, so even though this game isn't Oblivion, it's the, the presence of Oblivion being this, uh, you know, other place that has multiple planes of existence and gods that rule over them, not gods, Daedra, um, you know, that, that's still a big part of this world. I don't want to spoil it, but um, that is the place where we get to do probably our, you know, historically our most interesting quests, the ones that feel really unique uh, when you get into those really high fantasy kind of uh, activities. They do end up being some of the most fun stuff, and then the rewards end up being some of the best. Uh, the landmass is about the same size as Oblivion. It plays, the, the flow of that is a bit different because of the mountains. So even though a mountain takes up, you know, X space, you can't just like run right through it because it's a mountain. You have to make your way up through it. So like those uh, locations with mountains end up being longer play spaces than an equivalent in Oblivion. Um, but we like the size of Oblivion. It was a good thing to shoot for. Uh, as far as how much space there was for the players to absorb. So we do have the 10 races we had in Oblivion, and it is just those 10 again. Um, I, you know, we feel that's enough, and it, we're more interested in making those 10 feel different from each other than adding, adding new ones. Um, and it's also the kind of thing where you're like, where'd this race come from? And there's probably some things we could do, but we're, we're happy with those 10 races. Um, and there is, uh, you know, uh, the racism you saw in Morrowind, you know, Cyrodiil gets less of it because it's kind of a melting pot of the races and where it is. You know, Skyrim, you're getting back to, this is the, this is the province of the Nords. And even though the other races make appearances, um, they don't like elves. You know, they're the original home of men. And they think uh, men versus our elves, the Myr, men are, are the ones who should rule Tamriel. Not, not elves, and so there is this uh, conflict between that. Um, so some of that does come into play. Some of that leads into quests and is the theme for quests, but a lot of it, <clears throat> depending on the race you pick, it's, uh, it's flavor more than it is locking you off from one thing or another. Uh, there is a sneak skill, and the stealth, uh, you sort of saw it during it where I, you get bonuses for attacking guys when you're hidden. There's the eyeball that opens and closes. Um, I don't know, if you, have you played Fallout 3? Okay, well, the stealth in that from Oblivion, it really goes to these different states in Fallout 3 between caution 
and danger and you know so there are multiple states that the enemies go into you know okay they've heard something they're gonna try to you know they're on a search pattern they're trying to find you but they haven't seen you yet and now when they go in, and when they actually get towards seeing you the eyeball starts opening and it gives you time to adjust what you're doing sort of says we want to avoid the you know instant gotcha you know we have radiant AI again and we had it in oblivion where we would move the people they go to sleep they eat they walk around they never actually did anything they just went places and stood there and maybe they ate and, or laid down so generally we find we need a visual to go along with that you know an animation they're doing and they're working okay is this guy a cook he should be cooking and we've built that system for uh, you know uh, making armor, making weapons, cutting wood, uh, working in a mine, um, cooking, there's, uh, you know, um, working on leather. And all of these things and, and activities we can have the NPCs do, we've built them all so that you can do them as well. So they f the people, the world feels alive and they have jobs and they're doing those things, but then when they leave that, someone could ask you, hey, go chop wood, and that same suite of animations and everything works for the player. And they're just kind of like fun little diversions. They're not even mini games. They're just things you go up and you click on. Your guy does it. Some of those will open up menus. Like when you go to cook. Okay, here's all the foods you have. Here are the things you can make. So not only do we have raw versions of all the meat, we have cooked versions of all the meat. Um, we have raw salmon. We have cooked salmon. We have rabbit and, and so forth. So um, they're just you know fun diversions for the player, while also making the other characters feel. You know, it just feels more real, they feel more alive. Uh, what I can tell you is there's crafting for each of the um, major disciplines. So the, the magic crafting one is enchanting, where you make your own magic items. Um, the combat one is smithing, you make your own armor and weapons and improve them. And then we've moved alchemy for us kind of into the stealth. You know that ranger role of going through the forest and making potions. So that for us in this game is the stealth uh, crafting one. And enchanting for, I mean, alchemy really is something we can take advantage of in this game, l like we did in Oblivion, because we have these forests and these collection aspects. So uh, we're not quite talking about alchemy yet, how it works, but it does, um, it does work a bit differently uh, than Oblivion in some interesting ways. Alchemy, smithing, enchanting are all skills. And so you'll, you know, you'll level up by doing those things, and you'll... Um, you're also going to create the most interesting items you can create come out of those versus cooking or chopping wood or those kind of things. The easy answer is it's just more manpower and more time. You know, our level design staff and our art staff is, is bigger and they, you know, have really taken to making these all unique. Um, so obviously with that number, there's going to be some gameplay things or things we do that repeat. Uh, but not in the same way. Visually um, and design-wise, each of the dungeons plays out differently. Some of those are tiny, so that number um, is very big, but you know, I'd say at least half of those are small. You know, you go in, you come out, it may have been 15 minutes, uh, but you feel like you, you accomplished something. And they range from that to the you know, one to two hour epic dungeon. You know, we try to make each time the, the you know, ultimate warrior game, the ultimate wizard game, and the ultimate thief stealth game. Uh, and so we want to pay off on all those gameplay styles. Guilds are where we do that. But they are, they're different than we've done before, but we still want to pay off on people who want to, you know, perform those roles.